Man, you take your liberty. Bless you. Amen. Dudes. Good morning. Good morning. Um, again, I'm going to be myself and do what I normally do. And when I do this, this is actually, the whole sermon is about what I'm getting ready to do this very second. So right now I believe that I am one because of the blood of Jesus with him and his body and everyone in here. And because I am one with him and one with you, I take you by the hand and I have access to heaven and I step in to heaven right now. And I bring you in to heaven right now. And I feel the embrace of the Father all around you. I feel the embrace of the Father, His strength pouring into you. I feel His love just radiating and breaking loose the things that need to break loose and freeing you to be who you are. And I'm just releasing healing, wholeness, and goodness and kindness upon you right now. And I'm just believing that it would radiate inside of you the realness of who He is inside of you. Now that you would experience His peace and His goodness and His kindness. Some of you, I just see the, the presence of the Father and even, this might sound crazy, like the presence of a mother and she's adorning you. She's adorning you. She's causing you to be glorified. She's, she's putting in the detail in your life right now. She's, she's just bringing this reality of kindness. And a father who's providing for you. A father who is surrounding you. And, and with the presence of a father and a mother, it's a presence of family around you. Where you've had no family, I see you surrounded by family. I see that union. I see that oneness. I see that closeness that's there right now. And I see that strength pouring inside of you. Pouring inside of you. Deep, deep inside of you. And strengthening who you are right now. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Okay, title today is Heaven and Engaging Heaven and also the word ascension. Okay, it's going to be a little different. It's going to be a little bit crazy at moments, but I feel like the Lord wanted me to to share this and this, this stuff. I've been experiencing this probably for close to seven years right now in my life. I've walked with the Lord since I was 17. I'm 51 right now. So um, you take the years and figure that. But in the last seven year, years, there's been an acceleration of what God's been doing in my life. A massive acceleration of increase and, and all kinds of uh, major, major things happening in my life. And if you want to know the secret of what I walk in, what I'm sharing today is the secret. It's the secret. It's the mystery. It's the mystery of what, what, what I've learned to walk in. Uh, when, you know, we go back and... Uh, okay. Let me, let me just share a little testimony. Okay, years ago, probably when I was about 18 years old... Uh, we had a missionary come to the church, which was Trinity Presbyterian Church here in, in Florence. And he came, he was from Mexico, and um, he came and he felt like he was supposed to speak to the youth. And I was in that meeting that night, and he said, I feel very strongly that there's some of you, and this was me to a precise, like he, he came to speak a message, but I believe he came specifically for me. But he said, there were some young people here that are hurt by their father. They're deeply hurt by their father. They've been rejected. They don't have an established relationship with their father. They're deeply wounded. And that was me. And he said, God wants to show you a reality of God being father. And he said, you're actually fine with Jesus. 
You might even be fine with the Holy Spirit, but you have a problem with Him being Father because deep down, you're angry. And really, inside of me, I was basically, I've been hurt and wounded by my own father. And deep down, I said, no person will ever take that place in my life again. I will not allow anyone to take that place. Even God. I was hurt and I was upset. So God used that man to ask my permission. God will never force himself upon you. He will always ask your permission. So at that moment, he asked permission if he could reveal himself to me as daddy. They took me into a prayer room and they prayed for me. And a huge revelation of God being my daddy was revealed to me. I was so healed from trauma, rejection, abandonment. All kinds of things happened in that prayer room at that night. They prayed over me for probably for two hours and I cried like a baby. And just trauma was removed. And just all this trauma and trauma was removed from me. What was it like after that? The next few days, I was like going to my job and where I worked and everything. And I felt like, and before I'd be like feeling the pressure of the world and everything. But when I walked to this day, I woke up and I realized, this is my father's world. This is my father's world. This world is is enhanced because of him. I have access to things in this world. I think Angie was talking about this today. You know, I have access because he's my daddy. He's my daddy. My question for you, who's your daddy? You know, and that's a, you know, it's a funny statement that we used to say years ago and everything, but the reality asks the question, who is your daddy? Who is the one who reveals himself as your daddy. Okay? So I experienced this wonderful, powerful experience in my life. And then when I experienced that wonderful, powerful experience in my life, I, things started changing, wonderful things were happening, and, you know, just thankful for the whole journey. But there came a point in my life where I wasn't experiencing him as daddy like I did before. Boy, I had great memories. I could tell you great, great memories of him being my daddy. I could tell you a testimony and a half about him being my daddy. But I wasn't in my times with him, experiencing him as daddy. Things got a bit more religious, more legalistic, more heavy burdens and stuff. And deep down, I was kind of sad. I'd gotten married and all kind of stuff. And, and, you know, life was good, but there was still, there was this deep sadness because I missed him being daddy to me. To really, really be daddy to me. And I needed that relationship. I, I'm not afraid or ashamed to tell, I, I'm, a, I'm a child of God. I need my daddy. I need my daddy. There's a part of me that says I'm not going to be trying to grow up and be all together and everything. I need a daddy in this life. I truly need a daddy in this life. So here I was so hungry, so in need of daddy and so in need of, of this reality. And uh, I got a job where I was traveling all over the United States. I was... I, uh, Earl can tell you I've done basically HVAC work all my life and um, I got a job with a company where I was doing the energy management controls and, and doing startups for the HVAC syst systems and repairs and they were sending me to California, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Louisiana, you know, I never knew where I was going to be the next week, you know. So it was constantly going and I loved being in church. At the time I was going to Lamb's Chapel and uh, uh, Pastor Lonnie and them, it was a great church and everything. And uh, the uh, traveling, I didn't have the fellowship that I wanted and needed. I was hungry for some fellowship. When I would go into whatever city I was, I would 
get on my phone and look up churches and I go and I had wonderful experiences at some churches. I mean, it was just heavenly blessed times with, you know, certain churches and it was amazing. But deep down, like I'll give an example. One one was I just even said one morning, I said, man, the Super Bowl, it was time for the Super Bowl. And I said, you know, I really would like to watch the Super Bowl with some family or friends. But I was... I, I, let me remember where I was. I was in uh, Nashville, Tennessee at that time. And I went to that church, went to a church that the Lord led me that morning. And I was just sitting there going, God, I really miss being home. I wish I could just enjoy a, a Super Bowl party. And I'm at church and I'm sitting there just worshiping, you know, and stuff. And there's this man that I had talked to the week before. I'd been there maybe two or three times or something. I talked two or three times before. And he comes over and he goes, this is going to sound so strange. But he said, God asked me to invite you to a Super Bowl party that we had. And I was like, wow. You know, and to have the detail of that God cared about me so much that he would set that up. You know, it was a wonderful time. But I had gotten to a place where I was like, I really need family. I need that uh Koinonia family reality where I met with people week to week, you know, and not just I'd be here for two or three weeks and then move to a totally different city, the the net or another state or something and be there for two or three weeks. And, and it was kind of like always meeting somebody new. So I was like, I need this reality. And I had gotten online and I was, you know, meet with people through just certain ministry type things that were really ministering to me. And this one person from Indiana said, I don't know why, but I really feel like I'm supposed to invite you to this group. And it's called Engaging Heaven Ministries. And it's out of Wichita, Kansas, is where I'm moving to. Okay. And uh, so I was like, okay, cool. Uh, let's... I'll do this. So the meeting came on, and I did the Zoom meeting, and I'm like, you know, they're real nice, and just meeting people in a Zoom meeting. And this person starts to talk about what engaging heaven really is. And they were saying, and, and this is some of the stuff I'll share, is that, you know, we're taught in the church that we, ex we allow Jesus to cleanse us of our sins, and to forgive us. And then we have access to heaven when we die. Okay? But the reality is, in the scriptures, the only death that gives us access to heaven is Jesus' death. In the scriptures, it really doesn't always talk about us dying and going there. It, it has small mentions of it, but it, it's not the focus. The focus is the death that Jesus had. And, and we were like, okay, this is interesting that they would say that. So their whole reality is, it doesn't take away the reality that when someone has died, that they can go to heaven. That's still intact. That's still real. You know, it doesn't take anything away from that. But the reality is that you can experience heaven now. You don't have to wait for a morbid end. You don't have to wait for a, an e illegal access. Because we have to go through scriptural access, which is the blood of the Lamb and what Jesus has done. Okay? And several times he even said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It actually means, and when you fully translate it, it, re it actually means... It's at hand, it's so close to you, that it's as close to your face as the air touching your face. That's how close the reality of heaven. And the reality of it is it's even closer than that. You know, but that was probably the most descriptive way that they could do that. Um, in the scriptures, it talks about us being in Christ. Okay? Um, and when it says we're in Christ... It, a lot of times it'll say, even says in Scripture, now faith is. It didn't say faith will be. It says now faith is. And there's this reality that it is a now moment. It is. This is what it is. This is how it is. Okay? 
in the time that God operates in, we operate in chronos. Okay? We operate in chronos. Chronos is chronological. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. Eventually, it will be this time. We have calendars even say, hey, eventually this is our birthday or, you know, or when Christmas is at. Tick tock, tick tock. It's always coming. Eventually, it'll be there. God doesn't operate in that. We do. God doesn't operate in that. God operates in what they call kairos. Okay? Kairos is now. You have such union with God. You have such oneness because of the blood of Jesus that you have it now. You have kairos now. It is now. This is who you are. This is who you are. Not who you will try to be. Religion it will teach you how to try to be something. And God is saying, no, this is who you are. Even the word salvation in the Aramaic means to remember who you are. So, when it is this revealing of who you are in the kairos, the now, a very vivid picture of this. Anybody like surfing or have ever heard of surfing, you know, and stuff? When people surf, that tunnel of the wave, when it's crashing down on you, that's kairos. You are in Christ. You are in that wave. You are now. Whew, there. I will even go and later talk a little bit about inside of him. Okay? When it says in, it actually it probably better translated inside of him. Inside of him. So, when we have that reality, that's what heaven is like for you. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It is now. It is the crashing wave that is upon you. You can't get out of it when you're, you're the surfer inside that wave. You can try all you want when you're inside that wave. You either got to ride it or you're, it's all down on you right then. You have no choice. This is who you are. You are inside of him and who he is. So as they were teaching about this, and I was going, wow, this is amazing. This is great stuff. This is awesome stuff. And then the lady who was leading it said, for the next 30 minutes, we're actually going to do this. And I went, whoa. You know, a lot of people will talk about scriptures and things and talk about revelation. But rarely will many of them say, we're going to stop now. We're going to do it. And, and I was like, oh, my God, the rubber meets the road right now. I was like, either she's really talking about the serious stuff here, which feels right to me, or, you know, there's something different here. You know, I don't know. And then, as she just simply said, we believe by the blood of Jesus that we have access to heaven. And she said, we step in. And as she stepped in and she took us all in, through the blood. All of a sudden, I felt like I was in this place. And all I could sense was like bowls of fire all around me. And I was like, whoa, what is this place? And I felt like it was a throne that was in front of me. And I was like, whoa, this is unreal what I'm experiencing, you know, what I'm sensing. And there was this, this sense of life and power and everything else and, and a sense of love that was just radiating from this place that I just stepped in. And I'm going, whoa, what is this? What is this? And this is where it got me. I looked up and I, I just used my imagination to see what, what God was showing me in my heart. And I looked up and I saw the Father. And realize it's been a long time since I've seen Daddy. Let me back up one second. I, it, I just realized I need to say this one little thing. I want to back up. 
there was this time where God asked me and he said, what do you believe? I said, what do you think about the crucifixion? And I told him, I love it. You know, Jesus died for me, paid for my sins, and ah, oh, you know, what he did, and you know, and everything that was in me, I died with him, you know, and I was like, ah, oh, you know, and it was so powerful, and you know, and he just kind of loved hearing me talk about it, you know. About six months later, he asked me, he said, what do you think about the resurrection? And I was like, oh, I love that. I, you know, Jesus was raised from the dead, and I was raised with him, and you know, I was raised to life, and that everything that, that has been in my life had to you know go through that resurrection and had to be resurrected to you know and I, I was just all excited about all the powerful you know revelation it was about six months later and God said to me what do you think about ascension and I went hmm I was like well hmm and I didn't have a whole lot of revelation I'd heard people teach about it I heard you talk about it. But I realized the way he spoke to me was crucifixion had a personal re, re, reality and revelation and it affected me. Resurrection had a personal reality and it affected me. Ascension didn't affect me that way. I had a little bit of a mental ascent, maybe a little, a little knowledge, you know, whatever. So I, I was like, well, God, I, I don't mean a whole lot. And I was just being honest, you know. And he didn't say anything, you know. Later. So now we'll go back. And there was the Father in the heavenly realms. And I looked, and there's Daddy. And he walked over to me. And he picked me up like I was a little boy and he held me to his chest okay I hope you feel what I'm feeling right now he picked me up and he held me to his chest and when he held me to his chest my head was on his chest and the first thing I started to notice was his heart beating going boom boom Boom, 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 boom. And I could sense, boom, boom. And as he did that, my heart synchronized with his heart. And everything went in line with his, boom, 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 boom. And I'm going, oh, and I'm just feeling this love closeness that I just missed my daddy and I had not had that time with my daddy in such a long time and it was so powerful and it was so wonderful that I was there in his arms and as I'm also hearing the boom 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 that reality the next thing I realized that he's breathing and when someone breathes their chest goes out and goes in and when my head's there, I could hear the air going out of his lungs, you know, in his lungs and out of his lungs, you know, back and forth. I could feel the, the thing. And what happened to my lungs? What happened to my breath? It synchronized with his breath to where I was breathing with the same pattern that he was. And it was, whoo, whoo. You guys were here, some of you here with Kay Fairchild when she talked about the breath. When she talked about breathing. That was my first experience of God just aligning my breath to his breath. He talks about it many times. Even when the, you know, the dead bones. He didn't just prophesy and say, let them live. He said, I prophesy the breath in them that they may live. But this breath, as my body, my soul, my spirit, everything synchronized with his breath. And it was like everything calmed down. Everything flowed and came into the order of who he was. His love, his goodness, his kindness. And, and it was so powerful as it, it aligned me and everything. 
And all I did was at that moment, I was like, this is so wonderful. This is so powerful. This is so amazing what I'm experiencing right now. And I said to the Father, what is this? What is this place? And the two things that he said just blew my mind. And the first thing he said to me, this is ascension. For the first time, crucifixion wasn't the only thing that personally affected me. Resurrection wasn't the only thing that personally affected me. Ascension at that moment personally affected me. It changed my life. It changed my life. When he ascended, he made a way for you to do the same. Actually, you are with him, so you got to ascend with him. You got to go into the heavenly realms, and you get to experience this. Uh, Pastor Lambert many times talks about the third dimension. I believe this is the third dimension. I believe this is the third dimension that he's talked about. It's the realm where... Uh, the best way I've ever heard it was I heard a minister that talked about this. It was amazing. And um, they said... God's asked us, we've asked God many times when we start a service. We've said, God, come and visit with me. God, come, bring your presence. Have you ever prayed that? Think about that. Ever prayed? I want your presence. I'm asking you, bring your presence. Manifest your presence. And God's good. He will do that. He will do that. And he doesn't mind doing that. But he said he was praying that one morning. And God said, I've been to your house many times. And he said, it's now it's time for you to come to my house. Come to my neighborhood where I live, where I hang out, where I exist. And the reality of it is, this is where you belong. You belong in this realm, this heavenly realm. This realm that, that you get to experience this life and this wholeness. And in the heavenly realm, some of the things that I get to experience is when I'm there and experiencing this realm, everything in me starts to align. Just like that breathing and that heartbeat, I align to who I am. I align to the reality that I am the beloved. Remember me t teaching about the beloved here? Uh, teaching about that and talking about that he loved me first? You know, I learned that being there in the heavens. I learned it. It changed me. It radically changed me. I was reading in the scriptures where it said, um, I have made a place for you. You know, and I have a house and many mansions and I've made a place for you. And, and he said, come unto me. But in some scriptures, translation actually says, come into me. And I was like, oh, I've never thought about that. And as I was experiencing, I saw Jesus and he said, come inside of me. Remember I talked about in Christ? So I went inside of him. Journey with me on this one, okay? I stepped inside of him. And when I stepped inside of him, the first thing I saw was his heart. And I've shared a little bit about this. And I went inside of his heart and there the blood was pumping. Poof, poof. And the blood was flowing over me, and the blood of the Lamb and Jesus was flowing over me, and it was washing my mind, changing my mind, changing my thoughts. And I was like, whoa! You know, as it was just transforming me. And I was like, oh, this is powerful. And they took me into this place where, yeah, you know, after I went through that area of the, of the heart, I came to this other part, and it's like the other side of his heart. And when I went to that part, it was this place, he called it the first love gate. And when he took me to that place, that's where he said, Hey, I want to love you first. And I talked about the scripture where we always believed that first love means how I've loved him first or like that. And the reality was I had to, and I saw him, that's where in the heavens where I saw that race with Jesus. And he had the shorts on and all this stuff and he had that race and he beat me to the end. And when he did, I was frustrated, of course. And, and then he said, no, surrender 
to the reality that I loved you first. And there was a part where he aligned. Remember the alignment. Everything starts to align in heaven. You start to accelerate and align in places where you don't. You, you have frustrations aligning in the, just the earthly realm. You know. But as I aligned, I started to realize I was the beloved. And that I was so precious and so valuable and so important. Another area was, I was inside of him, and this is crazy. I saw his name. I saw his name. And his name opened up. And I was like, okay. And he said, come in. So I went inside of his name. Okay. When I went inside of his name, things happened. Things changed. You ever heard that we pray in the name of Jesus? I think it's probably better translated that we pray inside of the name of Jesus. There's this huge reality of thing. But when I stepped into the name, he is called the firstborn. He is also considered the first, like he has like a firstborn blessing um, uh, that's a, over him. It, it's like a, a, a royalty priesthood. And all of a sudden, when I stepped inside that name, there was this place for me to sit. And I sat, like I rested inside the name. And I realized at that moment, it felt like a throne that I, stepped on, uh, that I sat on. And I was like, whoa. And then I realized something was happening when I stepped inside the name. When someone gets married, for the, a woman, when she gets married, does her name change? Her name changes. So as I'm in this place and I sit on this, this room, this moment of sitting on the throne, I realize I feel the, like the betrothing, the, the wedding, the marriage, the oneness. And all of a sudden, His name was my name. And that I wasn't second, third, or like that. He made me one. And one meant so many different things. One of the things that one meant was I was first thing on his mind that morning. I was the most important thing. That I became first the thought. The next was I was one. I was whole. He saw me as whole. He saw me without blemish, without wrinkle. Remember he talks about he's looking for a bride? And actually, in a lot of ways, I felt like I became the bride as I stepped inside of his name. As I'm inside of the name. And then I, as I'm in this place, and I'm inside the name, and I say a prayer. For the first time inside of his name. And all of heaven goes. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? That was the wife of Jesus. The bride of Jesus that spoke. That was the voice of the one who loves. Who he, whom he loves dearly. All of heaven recognized my voice. Because I spoke. And prayed. From inside the name. And it was like, whoa. Life changing. You know, total reality of realizing wholeness, healing. My soul started to heal. My body started to heal. Um, my spirit, of course, was healing too. All this stuff was healing as I'm experiencing heaven. The realms of heaven. We talked about the kingdom. This is the kingdom. It's heaven. It's the kingdom of heaven. What do I do there? I get to be who I am. I get to rule and reign. He, he actually calls us the king of kings. He is the king of kings. Who are the kings under this king? We are. Again, what does the word salvation mean? To remember 
who you are. Remember your origin. Remember your identity. Remember who you are. And as you go into this realm of the heavens, it, it's, it's starting to make you realize who you are. Now, where is the heavenly realms? I believe it's a, it's a realm inside of Jesus. I believe it's a realm inside of who he is. But guess what? That Christ lives in me. So that realm of heaven is inside of me. It gets to be inside of me. Some people will say the statement, they'll say, I go within. Okay? When I go within, some people will just say that, just go within, and they'll start dealing with all their, like they'll start looking at all their insecurities and stuff. And praise God that they do that to a certain point, you know. But, but what the Lord started showing me was that just going within is like knowing the truth, but not knowing the way. Wow. It, it's like you, you've got part of it, okay? Nothing wrong with learning to go within, but the thing is, the light that's in you, is it darkness? And how great is that darkness? It can overtake you. It can, it can discourage you. It can bring you to a, you know, a deep, heavy, heavy area. But what he wants to start is take you through the access. The access of Jesus. The access of the cross. The access of the blood of Jesus. To go into the heavenly realms. And at that moment, it is the same reality of going within, but it's like going in there and turning the lights on. And you go, wow, that's who I am. Instead of days and months of just sitting and going within and seeing all your darkness and everything like that. And it's like God really wants to bring you to a place to see who you are, that you are as beloved, that you're important, that you're valuable. Now, I'll get to a scripture. Matthew 22 talks about a wedding. Okay? It, it talks about a wedding. And it talks about the, I guess, the uh, master of the, of the wedding invited certain people. He said, come. I believe this is in direct relationship to experiencing and engaging in heaven. Okay? He says to come. But many didn't. They chose not to. And he sent more of his servants to tell them, tell them to come. And when they did the second group, they said no, and they actually attacked his messengers and maybe even killed some of his messengers so that he would say, come. There was, eventually he said, Okay, now go to the streets and the byways and like that. And whoever will come, come. So they went and they invited. What in the normal people in the church is what I was seeing in this thing. It was the people who were saying, come, come. And he invited them and they came. And all of a sudden the wedding was full, the banquet was full. And, and he was there. There was one specific time, though, he noticed that there was someone there that was there and w wasn't wearing the right clothes or something. And I was got a question. I was going, what's this, Lord? And, you know, and the Lord really started showing me. And he said, some people try to experience this realm without going through Jesus. Without going through the blood. And what did he do with the one that wasn't dressed in the right thing? He kicked him out. Sounds kind of harsh, but I believe there's an access into this realm. I believe there's a correct, proper access into this realm. Okay? Um, when I go, I ask Jesus to lead me by my hand, by his hand. And he guides me, and he leads me, and he directs me to all these areas and shows me and just unveils incredible wisdom and all kinds of you know amazing things brings the scriptures alive like I've never seen before and I'm going whoa this is amazing you know another thing that happens if we start to experience the stepping into the heavenly realms 
And not just stepping in, but truly engaging the heavenly realms. When we start to do this, and it really does have that same reality that the, that the Christ is in me, that this heavenly realm can be in me, then what ha- starts to hap- happen is that the light in me truly is light, not the darkness. It starts shifting. It starts aligning. It starts to, to move the hopelessness and fills me full of hope. And in the scripture it says, Christ in you, the hope. Of his glory. And as he shifts and brings this reality of hope, which I believe in some ways is not the word hope in the English, where it says, maybe it'll get better, hopefully it'll get better, maybe like that. No, this is who you are. That's what the word hope means. Hope means this is who you are. It's done, it's finished. This is who you are. It's an absolute. That's who you are. And as you come into this reality of hope, which we have in the armor, you know, there's the helmet, and people call it the helmet of salvation, which if you take the interpretation of it, it's the helmet of remembering who you are. Okay? Now, in Thessalonians, it's also mentioned again, but it has a different name, and it's called the helmet of hope. So when you put that helmet on, you start to get the reality of who you are. You start to come and know who you are. You become aware of who you are. You become aware of who you belong to. You become aware of where you live. Your reality in this presence. Your your whole purpose. Your destiny. Everything that you have for you in this area is being revealed in the heavenly realms. And reality, it's in you, but it's also huge. You know, there's a lot bigger stuff in you than you know. You know, um... You're, you've just been told by the doctors just a little bit that's inside of you, but there's more. And, you know, Jesus is wanting you to realize who's inside of you, what's inside of you, the realms of, of what he has inside of you. So as I, as I grow, something shifts in me, my whole attitude, my whole perspective. Today, when I was engaging for this group, the thing that I felt like God was showing me That he was shifting the burdens off of you. He was shifting the heaviness off of some of you. He was removing intimidations, fears, jealousy. You know what jealousy really means? You can sit there and say, you know, we always take it more in the reverse definition and say, well, well, I kind of wanted what they wanted, you know, or what they liked. Now, the real definition of jealousy is you don't believe who you are. You don't know who you are. That's what jealousy is. You're constantly comparing yourself to someone else because you don't know who you are. And God wants to reveal to you who you are. So today, I saw jealousy being removed off of people. I saw idolatry being moved off of people. I saw intimidation being moved off of people. I saw these shifting, and, and I saw this wholeness re- going. All this stuff I saw in the heavenly realms as the Father was just removing all, this, all these burdens and things off of people. Um, when, uh, when I experience the the heavenly realms there are moments when i'll see something very specific either for a person or myself or a situation even the nations i've seen things that'll that'll happen in the heavenly realms and i will you know we were on a zoom meeting with a group of people okay in a zoom meeting we were Engaging in heaven. And what we did, and this is how the picture of what happened was, every person took responsibility of, of, you know, believing that he had access into the heavens. And we would share, and one person might say, hey, I see Jesus doing this. Or I see the Father doing this. Or I see angels doing this. Or I see, you know, Machilzadak doing this. You know, that's going to sound wild here, you know, but I was seeing all, even Lady Wisdom or whatever, you know, and I was seeing all these different people were seeing this. And some people would go, ooh, I see that too. I see that too. I see that too. And for it became like a corporate, you know, type thing. And as we're in there, I look and I know a person that's on the Zoom meeting. And I look. And this person is standing there, and I watch, and Jesus walks up behind them. And it really was the Father. Actually, the Father walked up behind him, 
and he stuck his hand inside of them. And then he just pulled something out. And I went, well, that looks cool. And I said, hey, I'm just going to tell you what I saw. And I said, I saw the father, and I named that person. I said, I saw the father reach into that person's back and pull this out, pull something out like this. And that person starts going, oh, my God, I feel fire on my back right now. I feel fire on my back right now. And they started to get healed of a back injury that they've had for a long time. And I'm sitting there going, well, that's really cool. That's amazing that that happened. And then the father spoke to me, and he said, Jesus only did what he saw the Father doing. And at that moment, I was like, oh my gosh, that's the simplest way to experience miracles. Go into the heaven realms, see what the Father's doing, and when you see it, reveal it into the earth, and it'll manifest. The reality of it is that we get to rule and reign. That's how you rule and reign. You go into the heavenly realms, you figure out what the Father's doing, and you say... Guess what, world? I'm bringing it in. I'm the conduit. I'm the access. I'm the son. I'm the daughter. I'm the child of the king. I get to disrupt this world with heavenly realities. I can birth heaven into the earth. I can change the pattern of this world by what I experienced in heaven because I go through the blood of the Lamb. I go through Jesus. There is a realm of God flowing from us. This is who you are. You have the ability to disrupt this world. You have the ability to change the future. You have the ability to change circumstances. If somebody says that something bad's going to happen, you have the ability to change that. If you have a fear, guess what? You have the ability to change that fear into hope. If they see in your your bloodline, hey, you got a certain kind of disease in your family line, guess what? You have a new bloodline. And you can change that. You can change it. And you get to engage. Engage in heaven. Okay, I can ask and say... Take me in. And that's what I did for a long time. I'd go into the heavenly realms and I'd go, wow, wow, this is so cool. And it was really cool. But he started wanting me to engage with him. And there would be times where I, I'd see the Father like summon me and I'd go to him and, and he'd dance with me through the heavens and he'd dance and have fun in the heavens and, and enjoy and have a wonderful time in the heavens. During that time, I'd find things shifting and changing all through my life and couldn't understand why they were shifting and changing because I was engaging in heaven. Sometimes he'd show me something and I'd go, what is this? You know, I'd be like, I don't know what that is. You know? And normally I would just, just be trying to figure it out going, huh, where, what is that? What is that? No, after a while I started learning. I'm a kid. He's the father. He knows heaven. I don't. So, hey, I just saw this. What is this? And then the next thing he'd say, blow my mind. And I'd be like, Oh my gosh. And it'd be something very specific to my life or someone else's life or something in the atmosphere, a nation, you know, a direction or something. But I learned to engage. If you don't understand something, simply ask God. If you don't understand something in your life, ask God. He'll explain He wants to engage with you. If you were married to someone and you just sat there and went, hmm, and never really engage with them, they'd be like, okay, this is a little weird, you know. But there's a point where I engage in the heavenly realms. And, I, you know, I mean, just, you know, it's going to sound crazy, but hey, you know, some people don't know if they believe uh, angels are real. You know, angels operate according to the kingdom of God. They operate according to the wisdom of the Father. The Father will not force himself upon you, nor will angels. But if you give them permission, guess what? They will flood your life. They will flood your life the moment you start to give them permission. You want a radical change? Give some angels permissions in your life. They want to do a lot for you. They they are bored and ready to do a lot for you. Thousands upon thousands of angels are ready to help. So, all this said... There's a place where I experienced in, um, in heaven, I call it my mountain. 
Okay, in scriptures, we always just see mountains as like, oh my, that's my burden, that's my... But, you know, there's, there's also scriptures where it says, who will send to the mountain of the Lord? One with clean hands and, you know, pure heart and all that kind of stuff. And the reality is the blood of Jesus allows us you to go to this place and to this place of the mountain. And when you get to the mountain, it's the place where you rule and reign. It's the place where you release what's in the heavens into the earth. You birth forth. You, and the way I do it, I picture all this stuff that I've just experienced in the heavenly realms is up on this mountain. And I, as a kid, I go up to it and I just push it into the earth. I push it into the earth. And when I do, I see things start to manifest and I'm going, this is crazy that I'm seeing these things manifest. It's crazy that I'm, all this stuff. But the reality is, this is the realm that God wants you to live in. Yes. Okay. Isn't it strange that we're just taught from general church, not, a, not attacking the church, but isn't it strange that we're taught the simplicity of that when we die, we'll eventually experience heaven. But it doesn't really, nobody hadn't been talking for a long time about heaven now. Heaven being now. I thought about it, I was like, oh. And I felt like the Father started showing me, and he said, yeah, it's been a tactic. It's been a tactic of almost like the enemy that would keep you from this realm. That would keep you from experiencing this. Years ago, um, Gene Mobley, which was Perry Mobley's wife, which he was the pastor of Trinity Presbyterian Church for years. He's passed on, been you know, with the Lord and everything now. But Jean asked me one day, she said, Robert, I just feel really strongly you're supposed to do a study on Nehemiah. And I went, oh? You know, I was like, huh. So she actually had me teach class on Nehemiah as I learned it. So I started with the gates in Nehemiah. And I did not realize her challenging me to learn about Nehemiah would change my life so much. But there was a place called the East Gate. Okay. In the East Gate, it was completely blocked up. It was, in Scripture, it was an active gate at one point and completely blocked up. And they didn't really know why. Some of them speculated that that was supposed to be the east where the return of the Lord was, you know, and they were trying to... And I kept saying, okay, God, maybe that is. But I said, I really feel like there's something here about this. Will you reveal this to me? So I did study, put study, and study. And I came across that one of the names of the east gate was the ascension gate. That the enemy had blocked it. He had blocked the reality. You know where this, you know, when, when you think about Jerusalem and the gates and all that kind of stuff, and we always think, okay, this is heaven, this, you know, thing. I really believe it's us. There are many gateways in your life that have been destroyed and beaten and de destroyed by the enemy and hurt, and there are walls that are crumbling and all that kind of stuff. And God wants to restore the walls, restore the gateways, restore all these things inside of you. But one of them is the East Gate which is the ascension gate, and that has been blocked, it has been discounted, it is not important. And I believe that the Lord is saying it is extremely important. Yes. It's extremely important. So I just believe by faith that God would just unblock this ascension gate in you guys. He would unblock this area, that he would teach you and guide you and that he would show you the access through the blood of the Lamb. Only through the blood of the Lamb. Only through the blood of the Lamb. He would teach you the access of the, of the ascension. Teach you the access into heaven. Teach you what heaven is really like. And where, where it is and how it exists in you. And how it's supposed to change your life. And, and I'm just believing that the realms of heaven would open up for you and that you would experience your father, your reality of even God being like mother and your reality of God being family and the body of Christ and your oneness with everything that he has, that it is now, that it is now, that you have access to it now. 
Um, I felt really impressed to do something. I, this is kind of the end of this, but this is something I learned in the heavenly realms. And I feel like I'm supposed to share this. I'm going to do it really quick. Okay. First Peter 5, 5, I believe, uh, is a scripture that talks about... Um, I didn't even realize that somebody had put that up there. Uh, I, I believe in that scripture it says, um, yeah, likewise, you younger submit yourselves unto the elder, um, to one another, and be clothed in humility. For God resisted the proud and giveth grace to the humble. The part that I want you to see is God resisted the proud and give grace to the humble. Why would he resist the proud? Why would he give grace to the humble? What is he doing? Is he a killjoy? You know, is he... Something wrong here. Now, what is he doing here? Okay, let's go to 1 Peter 5, 6. Thank you. I didn't realize you had all this up here. Okay, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Understand, it says that word, under the mighty hand. Picture a real hand and under the mighty hand of God, and he may exalt you in due time. Okay, the humble yourself, okay, we talk about this in churchology, okay, humble. But if you really take the word in our English language, we don't really know what humbling ourselves really means, okay? We don't know. We can try to scripturally figure it out, whatever. But we're just like, you know, practically, if I said, hey, go eat lunch, you know how to eat lunch, okay? You know, but if I said today, go humble yourself, you'd be like, uh... Uh, I'm not real sure what I'm supposed to do. You know, it, it's, there, there's, there's not real clarity to that. The next scripture, okay, listen, the next scripture is teaching you how to humble yourself. It gives you the practical way to humble yourself. 1 Peter 5, 7. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. That's actually how to humble yourself. Is cast all your burdens. All your cares, all your concerns, all your worries, even your desires. Some people have great desires, and those desires have led them astray. There's nothing wrong that you have the desires. It's you following them is where the problem is. Cast those, even those desires upon the Lord. Cast those desires. Cast them all upon the Lord. Okay, when we cast our cares upon the Lord, what is this actually doing? What is he actually saying here? I believe it's choosing not to worry. Because when I carry all my burdens, all my cares, I'm telling God, hey, I can handle it. I can handle it. And he's saying, no, you can't. No, you can't. No, no, I can handle it. I can figure it out. I can figure it out. And he's like, no, you can't. No, you can't. And he said, I am urging you to cast your cares. If I'm saying to God, no, I can handle it, guess what that is? It's pride. Is worry pride? Yes, it is. A lot of people don't know that. Worry is pride. The moment I say, I can try to figure it out I, like that, what does he say he does to the proud? He resists the proud. So if you are worrying in your life, God is resisting you. If you're worrying about something, God is resisting you wow. because it's pride wow. and it's you saying, I can handle it. I can handle it. I can handle it. He says, cast all your cares upon him for he careth for you. Does he say just give them? It's more dramatic. Like, saying, here, these belong. Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm, here, these belong to you. I'm casting this upon you. So I cast all those things upon you. Okay, the next scripture is where it's huge. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Okay, we're not sure exactly if we believe fully in the devil right now or, or if we just think it's our thought patterns and our, you know, our imaginations that have built up. But either way, it's being like a roaring lying against you walking about seeking whom he may devour who is it he may devour 
We have religiously said, it's the person that sins, and the person that did this, and there's a person that done that, and person like, no. That's all dealt with by the blood of the Lamb. Right here, in the context, the one he may devour are the ones who choose not to cast their cares upon the Lord. In the context of the scripture, it is saying, or it's those who choose not to cast their worries and their cares and their desires or their burdens upon the Lord. So why would God resist you in your pride, in your worry, in your stress? Is He a killjoy? No. He is protecting you from that roaring lion. The one who wants to devour you. But what happened? I was so worried over a situation. I was stressed. I learned this. <coughs> I started going, I cast this upon you. About two seconds later, the enemy would convince me to worry again. And I'd pick it back up. Because <laughs> I lived my whole life <laughs> worrying about it. And he said, no, I said to cast it upon me. So I did. And I might have gone an hour the next time going, well, I feel peace now. Woo, yeah. But an hour later, I'd pick it up again. And he said, no, cast it upon me. And it might have gone two hours. And then I'd learn, hey, I did it again. And he said, cast it. And eventually, I started learning the pattern that I was in. And I started learning. I'd go a whole day and say, Hey, I hadn't thought about this all day, and I've been casting upon the Lord. I've been a child going, he's my dad. He can handle this. <coughs> I cast it upon him. Then I might worry, and he'd say, no, cast it upon me. And i go two days, and then three days. Then it was weeks, and months, years. And I started learning. It belongs on his shoulders, not on mine. No matter what it is, it belongs on his shoulders, not on mine. But what happened when I learned this? I humbled myself under the mighty hand. I went into a place in God. I call it the secret place. And guess what? No enemy can touch you in the secret place. No devil. No thought. No whatever you believe it is. Nothing. Nothing can touch you when you go into the secret place. The only thing that can happen can tempt you to worry. Tempt you to go back into those things. But when I cast it and said, this is where it belongs. And when I did, it settled something, healed something, and it put me in a position where I needed to be. Oh, I know it was long, but that was the message that I had, guys, and I hope it blessed you guys. Amen. Amen. Amen.